Excuse me. Genesis chapter 1. And um, we're still, in, still, still dealing with, sorry, we're still dealing with Jesus and the kenosis found in Philippians where he emptied himself, <clears throat> where he became in fashion as a man, humbled himself even unto death. We're in the process of discovering more of this reality of self-emptying, of how part of that is that he became a man, and then in becoming a man, he functioned as a servant, as a man, and as one who was obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. And so, in my opinion, it's important that we uh, examine this reality of him becoming a man because that's what he became so that he would become a servant, so that he would become obedient, so that he would die on the cross. <clears throat> All of that tied in with Jesus becoming a man. <clears throat> And um, tonight, as we begin, I want to I want to deal with um, maybe we'll title this a change of image. <clears throat> so Scott looks like he's got his hands full there, but that's what it'll be. So, um, <clears throat> and in Genesis chapter one, let's look at verse twenty six. And God said, let us make man in our image. <clears throat> so I want you to notice, because we're talking about a change of image. And we're going to follow this through the scriptures to see this. <clears throat> God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. <clears throat> So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And so um, we see that, <clears throat> that though man was created in the image of God, or you can say, he, because the wording here is, is sort of interesting, let us make man in our image after our likeness. In our image after our likeness. And I think that's significant because a likeness is not the same thing. A likeness is a likeness. I um, remember years ago, I was down in Greenwich Village, and <clears throat> this guy wanted to draw a picture of me. And, you know, he's going to charge me a certain amount of money, and I didn't want to do it. <clears throat> and uh, he said, oh, come on, come on, come on. You know, I said, no, no. He said, look, I'll... I'll do it for, you know, less than, you know, if it was $10. He said, I'll do, I'll do it for $5. I said, no. And he said, $5. I said, it's not the, the amount. <clears throat> I said, nobody can draw my picture very well. You know, every time anyone tries, it's just like, please. Who is that? You know. <clears throat> and uh, so this guy, that did it. So he went after it. Well, you know, uh, he really did do a great job. But the truth is, no matter how good a job he did, that's just a likeness of me. That's not me. And, and I think these are factors, and we'll look at a lot of scriptures, actually, but we'll look at some scriptures to help verify this and see if there's something to it. Um, the thing that I liken it to is... Um, and I've used this example many times in years past, making a copy of a copy and then making a copy of that copy. And it doesn't take very long, and it fades, and you start losing definition and just begin to miss some of the <clears throat> major finer points of what it's all, all about. And so um, I think that there is a difference between uh, what we're talking about here 
of being conformed to the image of Christ and man initially being made in the image of God after his likeness. And uh, just to keep your place in Genesis, because we're going to be popping back here quite a bit. <clears throat> but turn with me, if you would, to the book of Hebrews. I want to use a couple of examples from Hebrews to mainly just stir up our minds and to open our hearts and to see if from this the Holy Spirit can speak something to us. In the book of Hebrews chapter 1, <clears throat> and uh, let's just read verse 3. Speaking of Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, the first part of this, the first part of this verse is not speaking about what he did. The second half is about what he did. It starts with... Uh, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down. That's all relating to what he did. But the first part of this, I'm going to read it again, and I want you to think, I want you to try to apply this to Adam, who was made in the image of God before the fall. See how well this fits Adam. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Does that, does that fit sinless Adam? <clears throat> okay, so what we are uh, confronted with is that though Adam was made in the image of God after his likeness, Jesus is the express image of his person. Man, what a, what a leap. I mean, a huge leap, not just a small leap, you know. And then just to confirm that, <clears throat> Let's look over in the 10th chapter of Hebrews. <clears throat> and when it says the law, the first three words are for the law, but the law here is not just speaking of 10 commandments or 20 commandments or 213 precepts, commandments, statutes, and whatever. I think I forget the exact number. It was 200 and something. Um, but it is speaking really primarily here in relationship to the tabernacle, the priesthood, the, all of those kind of things, including the laws and the statutes and everything. In other words, by using the term law, he is summing up the whole presentation of what went before. And he says, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the thing, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make those who come to it perfect. And so a shadow is a likeness, but it is not an express image. And if we, if we follow this line, then we will see that Adam was a likeness. And, and uh, <clears throat> I'll... I've got another scripture we'll go to in just a second. But before we do, we will see that this, if you follow this line out, that Adam was like a, was a shadow of good things to come. But not the very image of the things, just as the law was, just as the tabernacle was, just as the priesthood was, just as the holy of holies was, just as the ark was, and all of those things, really good pictures, but let me just add this, no matter how closely you look at those things, you will never see Jesus in his fullness, and in fact, the best picture you can get of those things is to see Jesus first, and that's the explanation of those things. That Jesus is the express image of God. Jesus is the fullness. He's the length and the breadth and the height and the depth. And, and, and that's what, that's what um, 
Paul said in Ephesians that you may comprehend with all saints the length and the breadth and the height and the depth and the fullness. That's what he said. We're not just trying to comprehend the work of Jesus for us. What, what did that scripture say? That you may comprehend the failures. That you may comprehend the saving grace because of your, your mess-ups. He's out of the league. He's out of the ballpark there. He's, he's knocked a homer so far out of that ballpark, it doesn't even count. That you may comprehend with all saints the length and the breadth and the height and the depth, all the fullness of Christ, and not just the things that he did when he sat down and by himself did so and so. Yes, those are important. Christ himself is the fulfillment of those things or the fullness. Fulfillment. He filled full those things. Those things are filled full when you look at him and you see the reason for all things. You see there, that son, there, that's it. You, you're not... You're not drawn away by every wind of doctrine. You're not drawn away by every televangelist. You're not drawn away by a good book. Because, folks, this, may I use Texan, this here book, this book is a good book. But if you don't see Jesus in this here book, You've missed the whole purpose of it. And, and if the Spirit of God can't get us past ink on white paper, then reading about Abraham in Genesis is no different than reading about Abraham Lincoln. It'll, it has no more power. Absolutely not. Because Christ is the wisdom of God, the power of God. And so, um, and so we're seeing a contrast here. Let me go ahead and go to the, the scripture that I was <clears throat> thinking about over in Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, and <clears throat> now remember... Um, We were talking about <clears throat> that the law was definitely a shadow and not the very image because there's a, there is a specific image that God's after. And, you know, this might be a newsflash, but it's not the Christian image. It is not the Christian image over the Muslim image or over the Hindu image or over the Baptist or over the... It is him who is the expressed image. Not just a likeness. Not just Christian in religion. But where Christ is all and in all. Now, let me just say this. Step out for a moment. Step out from Bible class and just talk to you face to face. We can hear this a million times until our hearts are stirred, until something within us cries out, I, you know, I want you, Lord, in that way. It's not going to happen again. I said it preaching a few moments ago. Now I'll just say it talking to you. Ink on white paper, Abraham Lincoln or Abraham, the father of faith. There's no difference, okay? You, you, you see the difference? I'm talking to you now. This, we just got out of a class. And we're talking reality, heart to heart, face to face. Do you want Jesus? I have no clue what that banging does to your microphone, but it's got to be bad. Okay, well, let's trust that that's the case because I do that. God has the writer of Hebrews start right at the beginning. 
chapter 1, verse 3, to make sure. Now, he's talking about him before that, that everything that went before is vain in light of this one. And then it says, who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed, it says express, image, the image that expresses him, that allows him to be expressed. All right. That's not going to happen in a Bible school class. It's not going to happen in a church service. It's going to happen when a heart says, you know, I'm just sick of me. I'm sick of religion. I'm sick of, <clears throat> I mean, you know, you can either get sick of religion and hungry for Jesus or religion will eventually turn on you. And then you'll go running to it. <laughs> you know. That heart after God, it has, to be, it has to be brought about some way. And if we don't cultivate it, then he has ways of dealing with it. He has, he has ways of waking us up and, and pursuing him. <clears throat> All right, so we were saying that Adam really, in a sense, was like a shadow. Didn't, didn't we say that? And that Jesus was actually the, the, the true image that God was after. Did, did we say that? We said he was like a figure or a shadow or, or a likeness. All right, Romans chapter 5 and verse uh, 14. Uh, let's... let's Let's see, is it 14 I was going? Yeah. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them who that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. That's, folks, that's stating basically what Hebrews 10.1 says. That was, in Hebrews 10.1, applying to the law, here, applying to the man, to the first man, to the first created man. And in fact, I think what we're going to find as we delve into these scriptures, we're going to find that, that Jesus is not just the man that came and saved the plan. Glory, glory, glory. The man who came and saved the plan. <clears throat> That's how most people view him. We're going to see that the first man before he even sinned was just an image and likeness that fell far short, far short that he was a figure. And that God always had this one in mind. You can, you can say always had his son or the son in mind. Hebrews says that. But let me let me let me say something. This this wasn't nepotism, where God's picking his own family members. This wasn't the son that got picked. This was the image that got picked. You can call it son. You can call it Jesus. You can call it Messiah. You can call it Yeshua. You can call it. The man upstairs. You, know, you call anything you want. That's the image. And given special treatment to Jesus, the name. Oh, Jesus, the name. Without knowing the the person, or you under, do you understand where I'm trying to go with this? Without knowing. What image this one is the glorious, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person because, and, and here it comes in little seed form, because what the father was looking for in man was not somebody 
special in the sense of the son, the, the, the man upstairs. The, the, the. He was looking for a man that would allow for God to express himself through him. So that the actual value goes to the treasure. And there is honor given to the vessel. But only to the degree, <laughs> you know, so I'm an anointed vessel. Well, big deal. Do you express Christ? Well, no, but I, I sure have the gifts, you know. I got the power. I've got this and that. But do you express Christ? Are you a vessel of the life of Christ or are you a vessel of the ministry for Christ? There's a lot of big, I mean, there's some big gaps there. The Father, and this is why, you know, we're going to go through a bunch of scriptures again, but this is why the scriptures declare this for those who have eyes to see over and over and over and over and over again that you and I must die and, be, and allow the Son to be formed in us. We must die as the source, as the vessel. No, you continue to exist. The vehicle, you are... Your personality, he made it. He's not going to steal that from you. You're not going to lose your soul, you know, in the sense of if you're born again, then he's going to express himself through your mind, your will, and your emotions. But he's also going to express himself through your being, through, by, shall I say, through you as nature, so that the true treasure isn't, the personality, but the treasure through the ve vehicle of body, personality, so that Christ is seen just as Jesus walked, so that the Father would be seen. All right, so <clears throat> it appears in Hebrews there, when we were looking at that, there are two images. There is an image that is a likeness. That's what Hebrews 10.1 said. Not the, very ex, not the very image of those things. The ark was a likeness. The ark was a likeness of what? What did it represent? Christ, okay. Let me ask you this. Is Jesus a wooden box with gold on top and covered over and, you know, I mean, I mean, when you see him for real, do you go, oh, my God, oh, my God, he's a box. I didn't know it was a box. You know, I've been trying my whole life to think outside the box, and he's a box. <laughs> you know, this has is, this is really thrown me. Well, The, the first chapter of the book of Revelation, when it does give you a picture of him, if you'll look closely at that picture, it's not really describing a person. It's describing the tabernacle. Feet of brass and eyes of fire. You go, you know, go with, you know, keep following that out and just draw, just draw that person in outline form and then start filling it in and it'll be a picture of the tabernacle. <coughs> Because God made that as a picture through which we could see his son. We don't, we don't get that. We see, you know, the, the woolly hair that he has there represents the cloud that's resting on the Holy of Holies. But we think Jesus has got white woolly hair. Whereas when we draw pictures of him walking the earth, he has dark, straight hair. <laughs> Are there perms in heaven? <clears throat> there you go. All right, let's go back to let's go back to Genesis chapter two this time.
Genesis 2 and verse, um, verse 7. Have you ever noticed how we turn there and I say Genesis 2 and I always stand here and I go, and verse, have you ever noticed how long I take to find the verse? Verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. All right. First thing I want you to notice is that this says, God breathed into him the breath of life, and he became a living soul. All right. Is there such a thing as soul life? Absolutely. It's even in the Greek, if you... Like in the, when Jesus is talking in many other places, when he says, if you seek to save your life or whatever, in the Greek, there are different words for life. But in the English, there's not. So you don't know what, you know, what is he talking about here? Or you just think he's using the same thing. But he's talking about our kind of life and God's kind of life. And there's a difference. And with that difference, there's a division. Not negative in the sense of, you know, hatred or animosity, just totally different and therefore clearly defined as they are divided out. The Lord God formed him from the dust of the ground, breathed into him the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Again, keeping your place here, let's go check it out in the New Testament again. Let's go to Second Cor- or, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 this time. And we'll look at uh, verse 45. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written... First man, Adam, was made a living soul. Now, let me ask you a question. Is this living soul guy, by the name of Adam, are the scriptures that we're going to be reading back and forth that contrast him with Jesus, is that going to be the fallen Adam or the created Adam? It is. You're right. It is. He became a living soul, verse 45. So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. Was made a living soul. All right? Could there be something of the image of God in that portion of creation, but it not be the full film of what the image was meant to be? Something of the light. Well, we know that it was. We know that it is. So what we're going to be talked to by, by Paul here in 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to be talked to not about a failing guy. <laughs> is that, we're not going to be talking about a sinning guy and how far short he comes to the glory of God because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Adam at this moment had not sinned. And it still appears that he's fallen short, if you will, of the full image that God had in mind. So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a life-giving spirit. A life-giving spirit. So that's a big difference. Now, I don't know how much we're going to define that right now, but I'm going to go ahead and just say it. There's several ways that we can define life giving spirit. We can define it in the general, modern day understanding, or we can define it in the true meaning of what God had in mind with this image. 
according to the heart and mind of God. We can define it by modern uh, religion, by saying, he's a life-giving spirit. Oh, he'll give you life. never gives you life on this plane without it being his life. Amen. And his life is the life that gives. And I mean there are there are, you know, I mean because a life-giving spirit, folks, is a self-giving spirit. Can I get an amen? Yeah. So if he gives us life, he's going to give us his life. If it's going to be on this planet, a living soul, he can breathe into us the breath of life and we'll become a living soul. But on this plane, it's a, it's, we are receiving the life of Christ through this life-giving, in two ways of seeing this, he gives us life, but it's his own life. The way a vine would give a branch life. It gives its own life. And he is a life-giving spirit who will always give his life. He will always give it. Yes. I just wanted to say that uh, the you know the first man Adam became a life-giving soul. I mean sorry, no, sorry again, a living soul. Yes. Uh, running along that line, let's just consider a couple of thoughts. Folks, if, if you're in the soul, what would, how would you define that? Selfish. <laughs> Selfish. Uh, concentrating on you. Self-centered. Wrapped up in yourself. Uh, uh, When, when Jim, who's taught the, the Spirit's Own Body class many times, when he teaches it, he'll draw a circle and say, this is the Spirit, this is just another circle, this is the soul, and then the bottom circle under it, this is the body. And he'll say, the body is uh, world aware, uh, outward aware, aware of the world, aware of your surroundings. The soul is aware of itself, self-aware, and the Spirit is God aware. Is that pretty much right? Aware of God. Okay. When your spirit is regenerated. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, our soul naturally, even without sin, and this is, this is the point, part of the point I'm trying to make here, is the contrast of the, of the first Adam was before for sin, this contrast in the New Testament, he is, not, he is not coming down on sin. He is not coming down on the failure of Adam or, you know, stuff like that. He is comparing images. And he's saying the first one, made by God, still was almost, was a shadow or a figure of him that was to come. Him, him. Okay, what does, that, what does that tell you? That tells you that if you get the old man dead and you, you start, you, you have no more draw to sin by you know, the old nature. No more draw to sin. What is it that got Adam and Eve in the trouble in the first place? Their soul and their, and their and looking at the outward, they saw that it was good. They you know make one wise. There's all this stuff about you know us. instead of self-centeredness, 
let's say self-awareness. Is that a better term? Because, because it's, it's not self-centeredness in the sense of the old nature just wanting to sin. It is, if it's a living soul, you are more self-aware. If you're living in the soul, you are more self-aware and therefore you're more cognizant of your outward, how it affects your body because your soul is in charge. So when something comes along and presents itself, the old, if you will, I'm not trying to follow this, the old man did not cause him to sin. By the fall, the old nature was established. That, the old nature was a byproduct of the fall. Well, the avenue, folks, was the soul. And so, even if the old nature is crucified and you are clean and clear and free, just like Adam was in the garden before the fall, you're capable of turning right around and being drawn away by your soul. James talks about. Okay. Right, it's not my goal to get into all that, but I'm trying to describe to you that we think if sin was no longer an issue in our life that we would be okay. I'm sorry, we're not okay, period. Jesus is what's okay. Yeah. Jesus is what we're after, not because we're in sin, not because we got a problem, but because Jesus is the express image of God. Jesus is, and, and Lord willing, we'll get into, I'll read a bunch of scriptures that show this clearly. And when it does, it takes it all outside of, of, of what we call salvation or redemption or whatever. Of course, I see redemption as bringing us, you know, like in Revelation 5, redeeming us un, unto God, not from sin. Those before the throne were saying glory and honor and praise, and, you know, who hath redeemed us unto, which is completely different than the average Christian who is just trying to be redeemed from something. Yeah. Well, who are they singing to when they're saying that? The Lamb of God. Yeah. Every one of them have their eyes on one. Yeah. Every one of them is given, given total, complete, glory to one. And they're not doing it there simply because of salvation from sin. Yes, that's a factor. But if it's a settled factor, at about 2,000 years after it's been settled and we're in the glory, if you will, if I can paint that picture even though incorrectly, if I paint it like that, we will start slipping away. And you see that. You see that in the book of Revelation. You see that where, you know, supposedly the millennial reign of Jesus starts and everything, and then Jesus goes, you know, at a certain juncture, and looses the devil who goes forth to deceive the nations. Well, I thought everybody was already judged at the beginning of that. I thought, you know, well, maybe they were. Maybe they're gone. Maybe... The fallen nature is gone. Maybe the only thing left is the soul, which was the original avenue for Adam and Eve to fall, and the enemy can start it all over again. And maybe there are people who never get it, even though they get salvation from hell or salvation from, and they never get it, and they live in a perfect, you know, let me just describe it instead of the Garden of Eden perfect environment called the millennium and they still are drawn away at the end of that whole thing. Yeah. Old nature dead? Is the old man dead? Yes. Is the work finished? Yes. yes. Okay. When we say is the work finished, we're talking about redemption in the form of salvation and fixing this up. But apparently something isn't finished. Even at the end of that time period with some people, what is it that's not finished? Exactly what these scriptures are talking about right here. 
We need a change of image. We need to be conformed to the image of Christ. We need that to be our goal. We need to know that just that, that there is something higher than the heavens. And it says of him, of him, he shall be higher than the heavens. What does that mean to us? Well, he's way up there. <laughs> in us, uh, living through us, so that God could loose the devil any time he wants to. He can let him run around, if you will, I'm painting that picture again, run around in heaven and go booga 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 and make his life. <laughs> We're all wanting to get out of here and go to heaven. But he's gathered even all of that up in him. And there's something higher than heaven. There is this reality where Jesus has summed it up. And the only way that's going to mean anything to you is you're going to have to get past just the salvation zone. And now I believe that this whole thing is a salvation yeah. zone, if you will. But trying to speak to those who are narrow in their view, trying to get past just getting us out of sin, getting us out of hell, getting the devil out of our lives, getting, uh, you know, all of that is in our face constantly instead of seeing that there's a plan that was a mystery that was hid from the foundation of the world, that God was going to place everything in Christ and sum it up in Christ and that when you look at Jesus in resurrection, that's the finish. There's the finish. Amen. Amen. Not the shadow of Jerusalem. And, and I, you know, these scriptures are all good. It makes me want to 
read more, but maybe we shouldn't. Um, let's go back to Corinthians so that I can finish up here or get close to a, a stopping point. First Corinthians 15. All right. In verse, uh, let's look at verse 46, the next verse after the one we just read. We'll read 45 into 46. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a life-giving spirit. However, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. All right, let me ask you that question again with a little more light now. That which is natural that he's referring to here is that the fallen Adam. No, it's not. What's wrong with it? It's just the natural image, likeness, like a likeness of the spirit. Am I right or wrong? It's, it's not it's not the very image. It is a figure of him that was to come. It is not Christ. Well, it's not in sin. It's not Christ. Yes. It's like you could even say it's innocent. It's not guilty, but he's innocent, but he's not Christ. Amen. Jim said say that he's innocent, he's not guilty, but it's not Christ. And that, you know, I mean, I hear, I hear these words from the Holy Spirit and the Father all the time, stuff that most people would allow, he will say to me, that's not Christ. And I, you know, no, I don't do it so much anymore, but I used to go, I didn't do anything wrong. And he said, I know. <laughs> That wasn't Christ. Have you, you know, I, I used to say stuff like, have you checked any of these other people lately? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I mean, have you checked them? That's sin right there. Look at this. That's sin right there. That's sin. Because you're the one who keeps talking about wanting to be conformed to the image of my son. You don't want it? Shut up. I'll shut up. <laughs> no, no, please don't shut up. You know, because his heart is for the son to be formed in us. Because if the son is formed in us, one thing is clear. We have been formed in the son. We have been, we have come into union with Christ. Because the son cannot form in you apart from union with Christ. Did you have a comment? Well, in Ephesians, when it says we're created in Christ Jesus, does that have anything to do with the, new, the man that is created Sure, but I think I get into that scripture eventually. Um, if not, I get into one real close to it. <laughs> um, that we'll get into some specifics on, on what that means. <clears throat> so, you know, let's, you know, before I finish out this section, let's make sure that we understand what it is that God is after. And what it is that, and, and, and don't misunderstand me. Let, let me just make it, let me just say it like this. There is a finished work that Jesus accomplished, but there's also a finished work that he is and we are in him. Two separate things. Jesus came, and that's what, that's what you get from uh, Hebrews 1. Uh, I mean, even, even as you go into that chapter, we don't see all things under his feet yet. But we see Jesus. Yeah. We don't see everything to 
defeated. We don't see everything subdued. We don't see the destruction of sin, the destruction of devil, of, of the devil, or demons, or this, or that, or whatever. We don't see all that. But we see Jesus, and that's what we want to see, and that's what we're looking at. Because for us, we ultimately believe that the destruction of sin, the destruction of the devil, not, not, not in destroying the devil, you know, but in bringing us not just out of sin, not just out of the soul. Okay, that's a good point, so maybe I should make that. How many Christians have tried to get out of the soul by getting into the spirit? Okay. The goal is not to get out of the soul. The goal is to conform to the image of Christ. Okay. Um, there are many who believe that if you're trying to get out of the soul into the spirit, that you can't get into the spirit because you don't have a spirit. You were made a life-giving soul and never had a spirit. There are people who believe that. And they say, Christ is now your spirit. Well, it doesn't make any difference if you have a spirit and he, inhabit it, he inhabits that and he is the fullness and the life in it. It's him. Or if he, you never had one and it's him as that, it's really the same thing. Yeah, because you're one. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. But to me, I mean, I've had people try to argue with me over that. Well, you don't have a spirit. You know, because I, I teach, I, I don't try to modify my teaching when I go to certain things. And that can help some people off. If I, if I know they don't teach that, and I say, well, you know, God dwells in your spirit. shadows my spirit, and he is the life of my spirit. Yeah, but you don't have it. Is your point we don't have or Christ? And is that any different than we don't have a rapture, we have or, or you know, I mean, you understand what I'm saying? The goal is Christ. It's always Christ and why? One, because the Father said so. Number two, because he is the sum up of everything God had in mind from the beginning. Yes. There is a resurrection, there is no resurrection. Yeah, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> there's a, you know, there's a, a what is it, pre-trib. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm in the middle of the tribulation right now. I'm with the Lord. You know what I mean? And he didn't seem to deliver me out of this one. Just kidding for those that listen in other places and love to pick apart what I say. All right. So uh, on into verse uh, 46. However, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. All right. Let's at least draw draw in on this thing. Let's focus in. Let's just come right in on this thing. And if we do in this verse, we will be absolutely clear that Adam wasn't what it was all about. He wasn't the man God had in mind in fullness. And he all he did was fail. That's why he wasn't it. Does that make sense? That's what most people say. He was the man God wanted. God wanted this and that. And, you know, but when he failed, then Jesus became this. I'm sorry, but before the foundation of the world, God predestined us to be in Christ. He didn't predestine you to be in Christ. He predestined that all that would happen would happen in Christ. So you're a Calvinist because you believe in 
predestination. No, I believe that he predestined the place, which is in Christ, and he left it up to whosoever will to believe in it and be judged to it. Yeah. So I'm a Calvinist Armenian. <laughs> what do you think of that? All right. So, um, however, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. Do you understand what that's saying? It's not talking about falling out. It is talking about the first guy in his best form right. is called by God the natural picture. And Jesus has the spiritual meaning of it all. And he's saying the natural or the unfinished or that which was not the very image of that which was to come was first. That God intentionally put something first called good old boy Adam, <laughs> innocent Adam, and said, you're just a natural picture of the spiritual that is yet to come, that the Son is what I always wanted, and I always wanted whoever came, you know, you can, you know, Adam, go be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, whether it's with Innocent people or sinful people ultimately does not matter. They're going to have to make a decision, each and every one of them, to go to the cross with me and die and come up in resurrection with me as one with me and I'll be the one. Hallelujah. Do you see how it doesn't make any difference if they're sinful or they're, they're innocent? The sun is it. That's yeah. where we're headed. That's what God had in mind. And when he made the natural, he said that which is first is the natural. But then comes what I had in mind the whole time. And the rest of these scriptures we'll get into in the next class. Uh, they also continue on the line to fulfill. So let's take a break.